Good morning, Oakland. Good morning. Ooh, aren't you excited to be here today? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we have a joint service today. Gracia Viva is with us. So, gracias, Gracia Viva, por estar aquí. Sé que van a estar llegando también uh, más adelante, así que bienvenidos todos. So, for everyone, we're going to have a special service today, celebrating Juneteenth, and we're going to have all the, the, while the service is going to be in English, we're going to have all the translations for our uh, brothers and sisters in Spanish, and they're going to be on the screen, so we know that they're, we are all together in this service. All right. Well, I am so excited that we are here finally, back in this space. Welcome home. I think, um, I think collectively our staff have been a little nervous about how many different focus uh, points we have for this one day, but I think we can handle it. So it is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day. It is also Juneteenth weekend, and we celebrate that this is now and finally a federally recognized holiday. Yay! And it is our grand reopening of our sanctuary. So welcome, maybe to some of you for the very first time. All right, we're starting with just a few announcements, and so we'll go back and forth on a few of these announcements. You've seen them on the screen, and they are also on your digital bulletin, so please find them there as well. Yes. June 22nd, the Journey Towards Racial Justice team has deployed a survey to the congregation. So we are asking everyone to help us in and do the survey so we can have more information and we can work better on this benefit. Nice. And this summer, so this is the last Sunday of our Love Thy Neighbor series, and, uh, and we get to celebrate that in a, in a big way by being here and by having um, a guest preacher with us. But next week, we begin a new series for the summer. And um, have, did any of you ever go to Vacation Bible School? Okay, some of you did, yeah. Yeah, so Vacation Bible School, Ryan's real excited about this one. <laughs> We're bringing Vacation Bible School for the whole family to Oakland. So this is adult Vacation Bible School and kid Vacation Bible School, and we're calling it Sing, Play, Summer. And we're going to hit some of those oh-so-important Bible stories from your childhood that maybe help you uncover some new truths about that childhood Bible story. And uh, we're also going to have some really fun music. We're going to introduce some bluegrass tunes, and it's going to be a really fun time. So I hope you try to make it as much as you can through our summer series, Sing, Play, Summer. And on your way out the door today, we have um, a devotional guide for you to pick up that will help you along that journey through the summer. Yeah, in our last announcement, on August 27, we're going to have a blood drive uh, led by the Red Cross, so if you want to know what is the qualifications or if you're eligible to donate blood, you can go and check on the redcross.org to see those requirements, and it will be nice, so we can all help with that. Fantastic. Thank you. That's our announcements for today. There are more, but you'll see them on Facebook, so stay tuned to the things that are coming up for us as a congregation. And at this time, Ryan Wager, our lay leader extraordinaire, is going to come up and guide us through our preamble. Nope. Mara. Oh! <laughs> Sorry. She makes really good notes for me to follow, and then sometimes. So, I have some difficult news to share with you. And that is that Mara came to us uh, three years ago as an intern through the Perkins Intern Program, which was so wonderful. Way to go, Chuck. And, uh, and it's a blessing always to have these interns come and learn with us. But Mara did a lot more than come and learn, um, learn how to do some basic things here. She, um, she went way beyond that. She completed her internship, and then she went to do a CPE, which is a clinical pastoral education. And then she came back to us as a full-time associate pastor and uh, pastor of worship, arts, and connections. And as you 
probably all know, she keeps me in line most of the time. Um, all of this she did with the plan and the intent to, um, to work toward becoming an army chaplain. <laughs> Zing! See how I did that on purpose because there's a little rivalry. Um, so all this to become a Navy chaplain. And today we announce that she has completed all the steps that she has to do to move in that direction. And so she will be having her last Sunday with us on July 18th and moving on to be a Navy chaplain. And we are so, so proud of her and excited for her. Um, we love you and we send you forth with all of our blessing, but we're not doing it today. So I'm not going to say all those things yet because we're going to have um, a big way to be able to celebrate that on July 18th. Um, next week, I will announce what we are going to do in her absence. So I hope that you will be in prayer um, about that for me and for all of us and, uh, and also for Mara as we pray our blessings over her as she enters into this time of transition. And now I will invite Ryan to come and lead us in the preamble. I need to get the... No one actually... Oh, there we go. I need to get the large print edition out. Welcome home, church! Please join me in the, our preamble, which is the, our statement of engagement, really, truly um, who we are and um, what we're all about. Please join me. We at Oakland UMC believe that everyone deserves to be loved, heard, affirmed, and respected. We at Oakland UMC believe that as a church, it's possible to offer this to one another when we listen, learn, appreciate diversity, and love God above all else, and our neighbor as ourselves. Therefore, as individual parts of the church, we pledge to move towards this corporate reality so that the church can be a voice for the voiceless, a home for the wanderer, a respite for the weary, a balm for the hurting, God's presence in the world. The service that we are entering into today is one that has been put together, um, crafted together by our Journey to Racial Justice team. And so I wanna introduce to you uh, our Journey to Racial Justice team because mostly you have only seen them online. And, uh, and so as I recognize you, if you would um, stand or wave a hand so that the congregation can see you and know you in person. Um, me, <laughs> Pastor Isabel, Denise Lee, Don Robinson, Asa Woodbury, Joel Farrell, uh, who's in New York this weekend, uh, Dom Johnson, Kent Roberts, Mara, and Ryan. We're excited that this team has come together and they've been meeting um, regularly in order to do this curriculum that has been put forth by the annual conference so that we might be a pilot congregation to um, enter into this journey to racial justice process. And uh, continuing forward, though, it's something that is going to be more widespread and other churches will do it as well. And we are very blessed to have um, the person who will be directing that uh, with us today as our preacher, who I will give you more information about and introduce in a moment. Um, but I wanted to share that with you so that you know that these uh, laypersons, these um, persons among you, have uh, worked to craft this worship service so that we might um, recognize the history of Juneteenth and also um, our place in the midst of this journey, um, begin to pray about and recognize what our role is as we together journey toward racial justice. I also wanna just take a moment before we, um, before we still our hearts and minds and recognize um, that Pastor Greg, um, who is one among many 
who didn't get to re-enter this space with us, um, is present in, in picture. And that's, uh, that's to make a space um, for him because I know he would so want to be here and celebrate all that this day means. Um, so I invite you to have him in your hearts uh, as we worship together today too. And now as I pour the waters and we listen to um, the prelude, I invite you to center your hearts and minds for worship. I'd like to invite uh, Asa Woodbury to come forward and to share with us the history of Juneteenth and then lead us in our call to worship. Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm Asa Woodbeard, and I'm just going to share a brief history uh, of the overview of Juneteenth um, <clears throat> and its importance in black America. So uh, Juneteenth is June 19th, 1865. Um, it's better known as Juneteenth. So it's the day in which the last African Americans were finally freed uh, from the bondage of slavery uh, in Galveston, Texas, uh, which was the re most remote location uh, in the Union at this time. Uh, this has been a very special day and celebration within the African-American community uh, because it was, it was the final ending of slavery and it was finally our Freedom Day. Um, we now have in President Joe Biden, our Vice President, our Senate Majority Leader, and our Speaker of the House, people who recognize the importance of this day and recognize the importance of our healing and of our struggle. So the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect January 1st, 1863. However, the slaves in Texas were the last to be freed two and a half years later on June 19th, 1865. So there are many different versions of why it took so long to get the message, but the two most prevalent competing theories are number one, uh, that slave owners were aware of the Emancipation Proclamation and decided to ignore this so they could remain slaveholders and have slaves work their land and things like that. And then number two was there was a general sent to deliver the message that went missing and was presumed dead on his journey and therefore another one was sent with a small army of federal troops to ensure the safety and the deliverance of the message. Uh, most of them were black Union troops that were in Galveston delivering the message. So. 
So either way, um, or either theory that you subscribe to, uh, Texas was not happy about the abolition of slavery. Juneteenth is special to African Americans because it symbolizes our legal liberation as a people from the bondage of slavery, abuse, being considered subhuman, and the systematic destruction of our families and our livelihood. So Juneteenth is really African Americans Independence Day because we were not free July 4th, 1776. America did not fully begin to live up to its promise of all men and women are created equally until Juneteenth, and we still have much progress to make, but we're moving in a more per the direction of a more perfect union. Juneteenth is sacred to us as African Americans because it was supposed to represent the end of a dark chapter in American history and give way to a more racially accepting society and the uplifting and advancement of African Americans. However, we all know that that is not how history played out, but we hang on to that hope and renew that hope every Juneteenth. Celebrating Juneteenth varies slightly from place to place, but overall, uh, it's largely the same, and it's on a grand scale, whether you're in the city or in the country. Uh, there's always a parade uh, that normally begins in the morning and then carries into the afternoon, and then as a community, we feast, we eat. It's really an abundance of food and games, and most importantly, an understanding of shared struggle in history. So it's really like a, a pre-family reunion, if you will. Um, so it may only be a day, but normally it's celebrated the entire weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's important to us as a time of remembrance and of great grief brought on by those memories, but also a time of even greater resolve by connecting with and honoring our ancestors, but also continuing to push for equality in American society. And that's why Juneteenth should be celebrated by everyone. And now I invite you all to the call to worship with me. <clears throat> the Lord our God is great. The Lord is worthy of promise. Come, let us remember the great things God has done for us. Let us not forget our past and those who have gone before us. Let us lift, lift up our voices in song, lift our arms in praise, and open our hearts in gratitude. You're invited to stand and join with us in singing, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
You're invited to be seated at this time. And as we enter a time for kids, as you know, um, we like to include everybody here. So you're all kids today. Um, we're going to have a really special treat of hearing from Denise Lee. And first, we're going to hear from a video. Do you want to set it up at all or just want to play? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I made it, Greg. Tried to get me here, so I'm glad that I'm here with you this morning. I am so excited to be here with you this morning, and as one of my first official acts as a new member of Oakland United Methodist Church, to be able to share in Children's Church. Don't make me cry. Don't. We already sang my favorite hymn, my grandmother's smiling. You know, just stop it. You're going to make me cry. So what I want to do this morning is share a video with you as we celebrate Juneteenth. But I want to invite the children to come on down and sit down here with me. Come on down, kids. Or the kid in you, you know, if you just want to come on down too, it's fine. Come on, how are you doing? And unfortunately, I did not give them the Spanish translation and they should be afraid because they don't know what I'm going to say. How are you doing? I tell you what, sit on the front row first because I want you to see the video. Is that good? And I'll come down there and sit with you. This video was done by the Dallas Children's Theater. I am their social justice strategist, and they have started an initiative to help children talk about racism and to get involved in conversations with their families and with friends and to be able to be comfortable to handle these conversations. And so we created three plays that were given to us by Idris Goodwin about race. Um, one was called The Water Gun Song, and this one was called Nothing Rhymes with Juneteenth. And so it's six minutes long. We're going to watch the play, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Is that OK? Yeah? All right, here we go. I'm going to come down here and watch it with you. Is that OK?
So you've heard a lot about Juneteenth today, yes? How many of you knew about Juneteenth? How many of you know about Juneteenth and what you've learned today? Really? Do you know why we celebrate it? Yes? Because we were free from slavery? Yes. Absolutely. And you know, some people say sometimes, well, this, this holiday is just for black people. Only black people should celebrate that. Do you know why as all people and as Christians we should celebrate together? Oh, wait a minute, the littlest hand went up. Let me let the littlest hand, yes? Hmm? It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. That's right. <laughs> Hold on, let me come. Yes? I love fairness. It's, only, it's not fair if only the black people get to celebrate. Yes? Right? But you know, God told us that we should rejoice with each other. And that's it said, we rejoice when our brother is happy. We rejoice and we celebrate with them, we cry with them, and we celebrate together. And when we do that, it lifts us all up together, yes? And so as we celebrate this week, I, and this weekend, and remember this all together, I have done something that would completely humiliate my children. And I'm thankful that they're not here, and if you tell them I did this, I'll tell them, well, no, I won't say that they lied. I won't lie in church, Lord. Um, so I have decided that the best way to help you remember what Juneteenth is about is to do my own rap. Wow. 
Heaven help us all. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna need you to do. I'm gonna need you to clap with me. But I'm gonna need you to do it on two and four because one and three is gonna mess me up if you don't. <laughs> so, Randy, so we're gonna do it pretty quick. We're gonna go. Uh, uh. Don't, don't, don't go too fast because I don't know it by heart. All right, here we go. Ah, ready? A long time ago in 1863, a man named Abe Lincoln set all the slaves free. To set things right across the nation, he signed what's called the Emancipation Proclamation. But in Texas, slaves weren't told, so they didn't know that now a law was signed and they were free to come and go. For two long years after the order was signed, 200,000 slaves in Texas were all kept blind to the fact that they were free. And nobody told them. So slave masters there, they continued to hold them. Keep going. And then on June 19th, 1865, a man named Granger finally arrived. He told the slaves and slave masters alike, all slaves are free. If you don't like it, take a hike. Today we celebrate Juneteenth, but there's still work to be done. We will do God's will until real freedom is won. We will stand strong together and we won't be defeated because when you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. All right, thank you so much. I remember that. So what I want all of you all to promise me that all of you all will look out for each other and work together to make sure that every one of us is equal because we were all created equal in God's eyes, right? We were all created in God's image, correct? So I see God in you, 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 and you. And we should see God in each other, right? So we carry that out into the world and we take that message with us and we're depending on you to make sure other people hear that, okay? Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats. Amen. Amen, and thank you, Denise. Right now, we're going to make up for something I already missed, and we're going to pass the peace of Christ to our neighbor. So if you will greet someone nearby you and offer them the peace of Christ at this time. All right, I know we could do this all day long. <laughs> As you find your way back to your seats, I want to invite you to open your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we have extra Bibles all in the pews. 
So you can grab a Bible and open it to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. And I invite you to listen for the word of God. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have a great, um, great joy and privilege to have with us today the Reverend Dr. Ron Henderson, who is going to preach for us and offer um, for us what I know will be an incredible blessing as we re-enter this space. And so I invite you to, um, to welcome him. I want to tell you a little bit about him first. He is uh, retiring this year, um, sort of, but not really, um, and entering instead into a different kind of work. Now, he's still going to be working for the North Texas Annual Conference, and his job until this point for, uh, for a number of years has been to be the district superintendent, not of our district, um, but of the North Central District. And as that time comes to an end, he's going to enter into a new job for the conference, but this time it's going to be um, the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the conference. And so as we focus um, today on Juneteenth and as we focus on the continuing work that we have before us on our journey to racial justice, I thought it would be really, really incredible to hear from Dr. Henderson, um, especially reflecting on this powerful passage. And so I invite you today to welcome Dr. Henderson as he comes to preach the word of God. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Okay, that's fairly warm. Uh, you've been hospitable all morning, so let me just say again, uh, good morning, and that, that it's a, a joy to be here to, to worship with you, um, uh, to uh, celebrate life with you, uh, to reminisce and celebrate uh, this Juneteenth weekend with you all, so a little more about that in a few moments. Um, so I drove here, I thought, what a wonderful place to have a, a church, what a wonderful place to have a ministry, what a uh, wonderful place to do ministry. When you walk up and down this oak lawn in the streets around and to see all of the vibrancy and vitality and new life springing up on every corner uh, in ways like we've not seen before. Hello, somebody. And uh, to see this area uh, reflect the true kingdom of God. And if that don't excite you, it excites me. Uh, you, you, you would better understand how I appreciate your context if you knew my context. Because I live in Red Collin County. <laughs> you know, in Plano. And uh, whereas it's a, a, a good place to live in many ways, you know, with, with safety and good schools, et cetera, uh, it, it does not reflect uh, the, the true... Uh, kingdom of God like this area and this place does. Uh, it does not reflect the metroplex uh, like this place does. So you can see when one comes from Plano, Collin County, back to Dallas County, Blue State, <laughs> Blue County. Y'all don't get it. So yeah, I used to live in Dallas. And, uh, and you celebrate authentically, not just on paper, uh, diversity and equity, where you're making sure everyone is experiencing the justice of God. 
uh, where you experience real inclusion, where people don't just invite you to come in and have a seat, but don't participate or say anything or participate in visioning and decision making. Just help us to window dress it to make it look good. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. If I, if I, was, if I was at the black church, they'd be getting me, they'd be feeling me <laughs> right now. But it's, it's good to be with you. It's good to be uh, with your pastor, Reverend Rachel Bachman, and uh, all of you and her husband, Reverend Michael Bachman, uh, sitting uh, in the sanctuary, who is, is a dear, dear friend, uh, who is like a, a little brother. Uh, he might want to think of me as a... a father, but I don't go there, just a little <laughs> big brother. Uh, and, and these are two people who uh, live out uh, the gospel with great integrity, and that the gospel, uh, uh, the word of God and the word of God incarnate is their guiding principles in their life. I know it. <clears throat> I've seen it again and again and again. <clears throat> Mike and I used to work together, but I was pastor at the uh, Custer Road, he was an associate, and I learned it. He had a biblical principle. He had a principle that he was guided by Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't care how much you preach, how much you beg, he was not going to compromise what he believed. <laughs> uh, and years ago, we had to work on a, a little issue that uh, involved him more than it involved me, and I was just trying, let's get past it any way we can get past it. <laughs> and, and I knew Mike wouldn't compromise his principles, so I said, just do it for me. <laughs> you know, just, just forget everything, just do it for me. And he said, okay. <laughs> and I said, you do it for me, we get past a certain point, it won't come up again. We held true to that, huh? <clears throat> All right, so um, um, it's good to have friendships and uh, uh, that you can make compromises when you trust people and you know people will do what they say they're going to do. So Mike and Rachel, uh, delight to be here with you. And other uh, clergy, Chuck and James and uh, Reverend Brian Phelps sitting out there in, in the audience, a, a great preacher, his brother right here, great theologian. <clears throat> and I, I believe uh, United Methodism and America is going to hear from him in a great way. And one of the things I'm committed to uh, as, a, as one who's been a superintendent, as one who uh, still participate and will be a viable and active member of the bishop cabinet, appointed cabinet that makes appointments of our ministers to, to put them in the right places, is that he is given the opportunity that the great potential God has endowed him with uh, will be lived out in our midst. I'm committed to that. God bless you. I've had mixed feelings uh, about this passage of uh, Juneteenth. I'm just looking for something here. Uh, I've had mixed feelings about it. I haven't, uh, I've, I've been celebrating uh, Juneteenth all of my life growing up in Waco. As a matter of fact, I, I, I always thought Juneteenth 19, 1965 was the real day of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, maybe they didn't teach us any better in Texas history. You don't need a lot of imagination for that. And it wasn't until I uh, went to seminary and was in Atlanta, Georgia, that I understood that there was another day that black Georgians remembered uh, January 1, uh, 1863. But I had... Uh, uh, mixed feelings. I'll go back to celebrating Juneteenth because I always have. My grandmother who reared me uh, was born 35 years after emancipation or at least Juneteenth in Texas, uh, which means her grandmother was eight years old when Emancipation Proclamation took place. It seemed like it was many, many years ago, but when I think about it, my great-great-grandmother my grandmother who raised me, grandmother, was a slave in America who was emancipated when she was eight years old. And my grandmother who reared me was born just, just 
35 years after emancipation. And so I've already celebrated <clears throat> and observed um, Juneteenth and this weekend, uh, not to cast a, a dark cloud on anything, uh, I chose to curtail my celebration. And my spirit wouldn't let me celebrate like I've always celebrated because I was mindful that many of the men and women who passed this federal holiday were the same people who refused to protect our voting rights. And I, I, I couldn't celebrate that when these same men and women know of the scores of states that's trying to turn back the hands of time and won't do anything about it. I had to curtail my celebration because I don't want somebody to pacify me and then at the same time shackle me. And so I'll go back to celebrating, uh, but I, I didn't want to celebrate so loudly that the people who refuse to respect my dignity and sacredness and ensure uh, my voting rights that every president, even Ronald Reagan <laughs> signed the Voting Rights Act bill. When they couldn't do that, I didn't want to uh, uh, not mislead anybody, not mislead myself. And I've lived long enough to know that sometimes when people are not for you, they will try and pacify you, give you enough to say, get out of sight, get out of mind. Now, having said that, you know, that, that's just me. We, we can go back because we, we, we should celebrate it. And we, but yesterday... I had to curtail my spirit because I'm mindful that those who think they did me a favor are really working against me and others. Are y'all with me? They, they asked me to come here because of who I am. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the text has uh, been read for us, and uh, I, I love this text. I, I just reread the 18th verse, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I would do a new thing. This is the word of God for the people of God. God, we thank you for the gift of this day. And we do give you thanks for the gift of liberation. And we know that uh, our real liberation is in your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us the courage to be who you have created us to be. And so we pray that we all find a courage and fearlessness in your spirit and through your son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God, I pray your blessings upon the preaching of your word, not for fame, not for reputation, but that someone will believe and do likewise. In the strong, perfect name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, service ends at 12 o'clock, and I got 10 minutes, but they told me don't worry about it. Um, um, the, 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 the title uh, for my message this morning uh, is a title that I, I think I would not have chosen time ago because the words of it are very simple, but the more I think about the title, and the more I have worked through the title, the more powerful and profound it has been to me. It's very simple, but powerful. So as I look at this context that we have this morning uh, from Isaiah 43, verses 14 through uh, uh, 15, 19, 21, and then when I look at the broader context of all of the 43rd chapter, of Isaiah, and I'll come back to that. Uh, my title is God is Faithful. I know that that, that, that may not give you a buzz, <laughs> uh, but it is a profound word to me. God is Faithful. Uh, several years ago, if not many years ago, uh, there was a gospel song by uh, the uh, minister of music uh, at West Angeles Church of God in Christ, Kirk Carr. And he wrote a song, and the words go like this. I almost 
let go. They say, I almost let go. I felt like I couldn't take life anymore. My problems had me bound. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me. I almost gave up. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me and held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy, says Kurt Carr, kept me so I wouldn't let go. He says, I'm here today because God kept me. And the lyrics go on and on and on saying that I'm here today. I almost let go, but God kept me. Now, now it speaks to me because I can concur with Kirk Carr that there have been times in my life and challenges in my life and hills in my life and disappointments in my life where I was right at the edge of a breakthrough and I wanted to let go, but Jesus came and grabbed me. I didn't know it then, but I know it now, so that I wouldn't let go. And if it's not your song, you just keep living because life happens. And when life happens, uh, life will throw you a, a challenge, a curveball. And so uh, as I listened to Kurt Carr, I, I, I lifted up those words and uh, knowing where I have been, knowing my journey, knowing somewhat of the journey of Oak Lawn United Methodist Church, uh, I come to remind us that God is faithful. Uh, I didn't just get here in time to preach, but I came early and, uh, and took a few days and I've driven around your ministry and your building and your no a neighborhood and this, this uh, bustling area of Dallas. And, and I looked around and saw all of the vitality and the vibrancy taking place. I saw the coffee shop over there. And I'm mindful as I have watched the news and know your pastor and her husband and many others of, of the powerful ministry that you have been involved in. I look at you today and you look good today. Uh, but uh, I've been around here now 42 years and and, and I remember when this ministry and this church was on a decline year after year after year. And I remember every power to be, every bishop that came along thought that he or she, he would send somebody else who would uh, uh, change things around to get you on the up climb. I, I saw a church that in the 60s and 70s was probably one of the most influential churches in North Texas Conference besides first Dallas downtown. And then I saw the spiraling downward. But in God's own time, uh, God sent a new ministry and, and, and blew his breath and time began to change and some things that people wouldn't embrace now that we have to embrace. And so uh, I, I remember a church and saw a church and a people who almost let go. I've been in cabinet meetings when they were talking about selling your building and putting somebody else here. But Jesus came and grabbed you and kept you and wouldn't let you go. And the only thing that I can say about that is that God is faithful. Hello, somebody. Now, now, now. So when, when you look around and you see the people here today and the diversity and your pastor and your courage and the news publicity you get uh, and the land you sow and where you're going. Now you can say today that God is faithful. But I'm mindful uh, that, that God is not just faithful to us during the good times, 
But the fact is that God was also faithful during the bad times. Are y'all still with me now? Now, to really get to understand 43, 14 through 21, you got to look at the broad context of the 43rd chapter. Are y'all with me now? Because in the 43rd chapter, God reminds Israel who God is. And God reminds them who God has been to them. And God said, now, I, I'm the one who loved you. I'm, I'm the one who loved you unconditionally. I'm the one who formed you for myself. I'm the one who blessed you on every hand. hand. And then God goes on to remind Israel, hello somebody, of Israel's journey or Israel history with God. He said, I, I, I'm the one, you remember, when you were in Egypt? He didn't even have to remind them that they were enslaved. You remember Egypt? I was with you then. You remember when you faced an angry sea? God did not even tell them what he did. I'm the one who was with you then. What am I trying to say now? See, we, 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 we understand the faithfulness of God when everything is going good in our lives. But the fact is, when they were bad, when you didn't think you would make it, when you were declining, when walls were caving in on a hello somebody, whomever it may be, God was faithful then. And if God was not faithful to us during the bad time, hello somebody, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here today. And so God, God reminds Israel of all Israel had gone through and this process of, of building Israel's faith up so that Israel would be faithful to God. <clears throat> Okay, you get that process. God remind you, I, I've let you go through all of this so that you know me, so that you know I'm faithful, so that you know I've been faithful to you when it was bad, so that you know I'm faithful to you in the good time. And when life throws you a curveball again, you will know, you know, you know that I'm faithful. God just used the process to build them up and to shape their faith. Uh, I remember <clears throat> just about five or six weeks ago, uh, I had the worst spasms in my left shoulder uh, for about five or six weeks. It was a terrible, hard time. And I went to my primary doctor and she said I had a case of very mild arthritis in the neck. <laughs> and she said it was very mild. And, and, and the pain in my shoulder and arm was excruciating. And you know, I work out enough and go to yoga enough and stretch enough that I knew the time was coming that I was going to be all right again, that I could wave my arm again, that I could lift weights again. But I also knew I had to get through that process and endure that pain and endure those moments so that I could rebuild where I was. What I'm trying to say is sometimes God will take those difficulties in life those challenges in life, the hard times in life, to build up a relationship with him so that when life happens, we have, we have a strong abiding faith with God. I wish y'all would pray with me now. And so God is faithful. God is faithful all the time. God is faithful in the good times and God is faithful in the bad times. That's why it's good to have a faith. As a superintendent, uh, every now and then I, I have uh, one of the ministers who have been entrusted to my stewardship who will have uh, a dry season where they began to question God and question their calling and question their ability to preach. It doesn't bother me because I've been there myself. And when I uh, visit with one of my ministers who having a dry season, in his or her life, I asked him or her, tell me your call story. And as I asked for the call story, I don't want to hear about their uh, uh, ups and downs in ministry. I'm not waiting or listening to hear the failures they've had or the successes they've had in ministry. But I asked them to tell me their call story because I want to hear about their walk with God. I want to hear about their journey with God. I want to hear from them what is it that keeps them 
wake all night long, not out of stress, but they're so excited about what God has given them. I want to hear how God has shaped them, how God has molded them, how God has redeemed them, how God has loved them. I want to hear if they understand in the midst of their valley, in the midst of their dry season, that they are precious in the sight of God. Well, I wish I had a praying congregation this morning. Uh, uh, not only do I, my colleagues and friends, we have the dry season, but even the founder of our denomination, John Wesley, had a dry season in his ministry when he began to wonder if he had faith in Jesus Christ. He began to wonder if he could preach again. He began to question the goodness of God. He had this very, very, very dry season in his life. And then in 1738, on May 24th, one night he went to Aldersgate, to, to church, to, to a prayer meeting on Aldersgate Street. And as they heard uh, 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 Luther's preface to the Roman epistle to the Romans read, uh, Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warm. But he had gone through this dry season where he questioned God and questioned himself and, and questioned his ability to preach the word of God. And he would go on to become a great voice for God. And what I'm trying to say is even during his dry season, when he was in the valley, when he questioned God, when he questioned himself, hello somebody, God was faithful to him then. God wouldn't let him quit then. God grabbed a hold of him just then. Hello, somebody. I've come to say to the people of Oak Lawn United Methodist Church that God is faithful. God is faithful all the time. I look around and I see you today. You're doing good today. You look great today, but God has always been faithful. Now, I, I didn't come to talk about you now, and I didn't come to tell you how good you are because the text really is not about Israel. Hello, somebody. It's really not about us, but the text tells us more about God than it tells us about Israel. Oh, you don't hear me now. The text tells me more about God than it tells me about you. Aren't you so glad that you can't fall too low from the love of God? Aren't you so glad God never walks out on you? Aren't you glad God never turns God back on you? It tells me a lot about God, about God's love, God's energy, God's creativity available to you and me. I wish I had more time, but I got to hurry on. Uh, uh, but finally, I wanted to get to this, yo, because I, I, I didn't just come. I, I, I drove around. I came early. I looked at your history, and I studied you. But God said, now, when, when you think about all of the bad and all of the good I've done, forget about it. Forget about it. I'm going to do a new thing. You know what God said? If, when you know of all the ways I've been with you in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s and now and where I brought you from and how I place your feet on solid ground, then God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, I, I love that. If you like what you've seen, if you like what you've been through, if you like what's going on today, how God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. So, so I come to tell you, I thought about you last night. I prayed about you last night. I meditated about you last night. And guess what God showed me? You look better tomorrow than you look today. And you look better next week than you look this week. And you look better next month than you do this month. I wish I had a prayer in church today. You look better next year than you do this year because God is faithful all the time. Isn't that God faithful? Did not they take his son and lie on him and drag him from one courtroom to another all night long and nailed him on a cross till he was dead and put him in a cold tomb? But early Easter Sunday morning, God proved God's faithfulness when he raised him from the dead. Hallelujah, somebody. So I've come to say to Oak Lawn today and all of us here, whatever life throws to us, I'm so glad now for the history of my people and Juneteenth and all of that because I know, I know, I know 
when they set back right every bad law, I'll look them right in the face and say, we shall overcome. We'll walk hand in hand. Our God is faithful. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen and amen. We are honored now to uh, have our mentor in the Journey to Racial Justice process come and join with us in worship today as well. And this is Reverend James Minor, who will be here and share in our prayer along with Dom Johnson. Praise God. Praise God. I uh, would not be faithful to myself without saying um, that there's more than just celebrating with others and celebrating Juneteenth. Because we need to recognize that it marks a time in the history of our country, the first time actually, that we were willing to say what we write on paper, we're willing to stand behind. And we will declare that slavery is not legal in this country. So anyone who is opposed to chattel slavery would want to celebrate the time that this country said we're willing to let God do a new thing in our land that we're willing to trust God and step out that God is faithful and is doing something new. And we can mark when our country recognized and was willing to say, yeah, we don't just make laws, but we uphold laws. And we'll make sure everybody knows that what we put in paper is a reality in this country. And everybody can celebrate that. Everybody should be able to celebrate that for it recognizes God's faithfulness as, as Dr. Henderson has so aptly shared with us. And in an attitude of prayer in response to that message, I invite you to uh, stand on your feet as we, as, as you hear us pray this prayer of God's faithfulness. We gather in worship as one people. Oh God, because we are your children. We gather as those committed to justice to all kinds. We thank you for a church and for pastors and staff who care about justice and take risk to work for it. And pray your blessing on his work in the North Texas Annual Conference. May it bear fruit. On the weekend of Juneteenth, this weekend of Juneteenth, we thank you for the liberating words spoken that ended legal slavery in our land. We also confess to you that slavery itself makes us look at an evil side to human race and we would, that we would rather not see. We ask for your wisdom and power as we remember what came after legal slavery. The Klan, Jim Crow, broken promises, lynching, exploitation, and oppression. As we study history, we wipe clean our eyes so that we know that we do not have an easy task ahead of us. We can make progress only as you give us the words to say, the courage to act, and the resolve to forge ahead in the face of inevitable setbacks. May we know inspiration from Harriet Tubman, Larry Hosier, Richard Allen, Martin Luther King Jr., Katie Cannon, Michael Waters, and Stacy Adams is more. May many of us learn how to truly serve as allies, 
giving more than lip service, taking necessary risks, surrendering privilege, speaking up, building bridges, and offering resources. Forgive us as we search our own hearts. Teach us to love our enemies. Bless the efforts of this church to minister in a time of wealth gaps, micro-oppressions, microaggressions, gun violence, voter suppression, and frustration over the lack of progress. Bless us as we work for economic, racial, gender-based justice so that all people can have dignity. Give us a vision for the time when all stand together, no longer divided, and when no one feels marginalized. In the name of, the name Jesus, of Jesus, who blessed, who blessed the, poor the poor and promised that the last, the last would, be would be first, and let the let people, people say, say Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. And now as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings today, I want to uh, give you a little bit of direction. You're going to do this in the way that you have been during the pandemic by giving online if you choose. Um, we also have a way to uh, receive your tithes and offerings physically, and there's a basket or plate, excuse me, um, in the narthex so that as you leave, you can place your offerings there as well. Um, I like to say we're happy to take money in any way it comes. So if we can assist you in any ways outside of those, please let me know. Uh, but at this time, if you will bow your heads and pray with me for the offerings that we will receive. Liberating God, as co-laborers for love, taking what we have and placing it on the altar of stubborn hope, we may these offerings signify our dedication to your story of freedom. May these offerings have the wisdom and clarity to remove obstacles blocking the flow of justice. May we have wisdom and clarity to do that work. And now with open hands and unshakable expectation, let us bring what we have to make this work so. Amen. great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't stop now. Keep my eyes 
above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you prepare to sing our closing hymn. It is lift every voice and sing. And I, I pray that we will lift every voice, not just on this song, 
but lift it as we go from this place. So please sing with us together as we sing, lift every voice and sing. Today is our first day back, not just in this building, but right here in this place we call home, Oak Lawn. There's a lot of restaurants open out there. And I would encourage you to pick up a practice that we used to do together and go eat with somebody. Go eat with somebody in any of these restaurants on the strip here. We like to support our local businesses and have a conversation with somebody. Talk about God's faithfulness with somebody because God is faithful. We got here, <laughs> we got here. I don't know about you, but there were some days I wasn't sure if we were gonna get here today. <laughs> I am so profoundly grateful for the words that have been shared today, for the songs that have been shared today, for the presence of you and these who are our honored guests. We are so grateful to God for your witness. And as you go into the world, I invite you to receive this benediction. God is with us, not only on the mountaintops and in the valleys, 
on the long stretches of ordinary. God is there making a way in the wilderness. May God's sustaining hand uphold you. May God's righteousness arise in you. May God's tender care embrace you. May the love of God do its work on all of us, awakening us to the roles we play, calling us to lives of collective transformation and liberation, nourishing us to dream dreams and prophesy of a world where justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Go forth in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Go in peace.